Hi everyone, I'm Dave Smith from No Kill Colorado and here with the No Kill Movement today. We're talking to Kathy Poblowski, the director and founder at Lost Dogs of America. Lost Dogs provides no cost resources to the owners of Lost Dogs to increase the chances of locating and be successfully reunited with their dog. They also provide education for dog owners on preventing the loss of their dog. And one of the, uh, the other things that we're kind of going to talk about a lot today, the program benefits local animal control and shelters by decreasing the number of owners owned strays entering the animal control shelter system and increases the chance of finding an owner once the dog is in their care. And we'll get back to that, but I first want to say, Kathy, welcome. It's great to see you here. Thank you. And uh, why don't you... Why don't you tell us in your own words about Lost Dogs of America? Tell us what you're doing, how big you are, where you actually work. So we had, I had started originally in Wisconsin with some other women that uh, saw a need. And, and really, I guess from my personal perspective, what I saw, I was volunteering at a local shelter. Um, and uh, I saw how, how things were handled when either a lost dog was brought in or an owner called in looking for their dog and I thought it could be improved upon um, and uh, that was really what got what drew my interest into that plus um, I had some experience in helping find really shy lost dogs so I kind of joined with with some other women we started lost dogs of Wisconsin shortly thereafter lost dogs of Illinois started up and we had you know in other states Minnesota uh, Texas Arizona um, and we, we saw also then a need to kind of mentor other states as they were coming on board. To, because we had made a lot of mistakes, I'll be the first to admit that, and we thought if we can help other states coming on board not make the same mistakes we did, we can, we can help them improve more quickly and, and increase their number of reunions more quickly. So we started the umbrella organization of Lost Dogs of America, which basically just helps mentor uh, states that that run a lost on page you know if, if they want to join us um, and we do use a centralized database system um, that we have a lot of exciting news coming out about that shortly um, but um, so so that's one of our requirements is that we all use the same centralized database because that's so important and something that we've been harping on for years so. that's great actually because uh, actually one of the things we're going to be talking a little bit about American Pets Alive Pilot for Social Services wrapped up in the subject we're talking about. And they were actually just talking the other day about how the shelters need to be inside a system where they are actually tracking these animals so it's easy for people to find. And I know that there's a lot of diverse different um, uh, databases out there and it can be really difficult. You know, when, when, when uh, my organization, No Kill Colorado, helps somebody, we give them like five or six different places to actually put stuff out there because you have, you know, you have, you have lost pets in Denver, lost, lost pets in Colorado, lost pets in Douglas County, which is right adjacent to us, Facebook, next door, um, all this stuff. And it, you know, and that's hard for an owner, for us, you know, we're in this all the time. We know where all these places are, but for, for a person who just lost their pet or a person who just found a pet, they're like, well, what do I do? Right. Uh, so that's great that you're centralizing that because I imagine you've had some cases where you had cross state issues, right? Uh, all the time, all the time, yes. Oh, okay. And so microchips, microchips def definitely help with that. But as you know, not everybody microchips their pet. I mean, there's still a lot of, uh, it's, it's still cost prohibitive in a lot of places. And not everybody knows to keep their microchip up to date. You know, there's still a huge, that's a whole nother subject, um, problems with microchipping. And so if the pet isn't microchipped, you're basically relying on some sort of database, you know, searchable database to see if you can figure out where that, that pet belongs. And like you said, there's just such a mish, mishmash of Facebook pages and Facebook groups and, you know, and there's some really good ones and there's some ones that are really um, not so good. You know, right. Yeah. How, how, how much, so how many states are now uh, leveraging the Lost Dogs umbrella? 38. So, wow. and, yeah, and so we do have a page in every state. Uh, so uh, anybody can, and, and actually there's a page in, uh, you know, in every province in Canada as well. Um, so anybody can file the report and make use of many of the resources that are there. But where we actually actively have volunteers running state group, that's 38. So the other, the other states, 
their their listing will get posted onto a state page and they have access to a lot of resources within the system um, but the, the owner has to be a little bit more motivated to to figure that out themselves whereas in our other states where we have active volunteer groups we have volunteers that actually can reach out and help the owner or the finder okay that's great so i want to move on to talking about managed intake as i said austin um uh oh sorry american pets alive <clears throat> Uh, which has the same director, Alan Jefferson. Um, they have been working on this piloting a social services model of sheltering. And the idea is to um, help, you know, we look at it, uh, you know, because of what we do and our love for animals, quite often we look at it as a pet service. And they're saying, actually, it's, a, it's an animal human service. It's both because it's talk, it, we're talking about keeping families together. Right. And one of those things is managed intake, something in the new kill uh, movement we've been talking about for, you know, well over a decade is we have open admission shelters out there that, you know, when they're performing poorly, uh, quite often the excuse is, oh, we have to take every animal. Um, but you don't necessarily have to take every animal. There are ways to divert animals and your organization already does that kind of thing. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people in the industry assume pets are better off in the shelter if in crisis or if the people are in crisis. Um, and those original assumptions seem to have been changing with organizations such as yourself and what we see happening at Austin and Pima County and others. Um, what, you know, what do you think about this um, change of really avoiding, av avoiding taking a pet into the shelter if you don't have to? Oh, I think it's great. I, I absolutely think it's great. And, and I did just jot down, um, I, I watched some of the uh, presentations that have been coming out recently. And I, I think that there are some really key benefits. I do think that there's some problems as well. So I'll, I can mention those. But, sure? but I do think that, that some of the things that I heard them say um, to help either divert the pet entirely so it never comes in, or if it does come in to get it back to its owner as quickly as possible, um, we're really great. And, um, and that's one of the things that I just want to clarify that we, our organization, we consider ourselves, we, we work for the owner, and we, although we don't take any money or anything like that, but that's who we're always trying to represent is the owner, um, understanding how devoted and how much they love their pet and how much they really want to find it and get it back home. So, um, when when we see things that regressive shelters do that prevent an owner from getting their pet back home that's you know what we try to speak out about or try to suggest ways to make it better and so some of the things that we've been harping on for years um are now seem to actually be coming to fruition with the, you know unfortunately the covid 19 crisis has prompted some of these changes but I think it's great. So one of the things that I've seen is, or I've heard them talk about is actually either, you know, reducing or uh, removing reclaim fees, which is one of the number one reasons when a pet does end up in a shelter, why it does not go back home. Because the reclaim fees can be um, uh, very punitive. Um, and often the people that uh, we're working with, they're, they're, they may be, you know, they may be living paycheck to paycheck already. And so now they can't get their pet out on Monday when they realize it's in the shelter because they don't get paid until Friday. And so then the pet ends up either passing through the stray hold and being put up for adoption during that time, or uh, when Friday comes, the fee has gone up that much more and they just can't afford to get their pet out. Um, and then it really becomes a choice of do I buy my groceries or pay, make my car payment or reclaim my pet. And so there's very many sad stories where, where pets do not get reclaimed because the reclaim fees were excessive. So that was one of the things I heard them talk about that I'm just like, yes, let's get, let's get this underway. Reclaim fees do not need to be punitive. That does not work anyway. You know, in the long run, in the long run, that person is an animal lover. And when they get back on their feet, they're going to go out and get another pet anyway. So why not help them, help them with the one that they have? I love that. I love the way you put that because um, you know one of the things that uh, is really hard um, with a lot of animal advocates is that they love pets so much they automatically assume the worst of the people, um, and that change in attitude I think is again looks like your organization has it, which is perfect because that that is the case. You know, people in certain demographics, and we could talk about this on another session. 
you know, may not have the means, that does not mean they don't love their pet. It does not mean that they don't sacrifice to take care of that pet. And sometimes we, we, we you know, uh, regressive shelters, as we said, there are a lot of great shelters out there that don't do it. Regressive shelters do, and it's, it's, it's not right. So um, you did say something, So, but one of these things is actually the reclaim fees. So this is interesting because I had another question there. So if there are no reclaim fees, uh, sh shelters or, and maybe rescues, but definitely shelters are going to be uh, generating less revenue. Um, what do you think about that? You, do you think that may be a problem? Well, you know, from what uh, what research uh, and and you know, listening to people that I've heard all this, it actually costs less for a shelter to reduce or remove the reclaim fee than to house the animal. So, you know, and I guess maybe they're going to recoup some of that with an adoption fee and on the other end. But, you know, I, I think it, it's, uh, I think it, it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to work out that, that if they're having to house the animal for three or four or five days for, for what, you know, for to, to get it ready to go onto the adoption floor or get it ready to go to foster home, um, that's probably, that costs probably more than the reclaimed fee would have, you know, would have generated. So... So, so with some of the things you were looking out, uh, at out there, I think uh, you saw some pitfalls. What, what do you see maybe some of the pitfalls that they have to watch out for? So some of the things that I, I three things jumped right into my radar. And one was um, talking about um, going right from stray hold to rescue. Um, so the problem I see with that some of the stray holds in some places are very short. Some may, be, and you know, for cats, there may be absolutely no stray hold. Um, so, or and some may be as little as 24 hours or three days. So we know from what we do that owners haven't even wrapped their head about all around about all of the things on how to find their lost pet within these stray hold periods. Um, and so now you're taking that animal from stray hold to rescue, and we know from experience as well that a lot of these uh, lost pets are dropping off of the database, uh, the shelter's database. So the owner then never ever has a chance, doesn't even realize that their dog was already transferred to rescue before, um, before they figure out what happened. And, and then once it ends up at the rescue, it's very, very difficult that for, for it to get back home. Well, that is true. I know that in Colorado, for instance, and obviously laws are different everywhere. Um, but you know, it's it's a it's an ownership thing, right? Um, it, they, it becomes the property of the shelter on the day after the stray hold, and if they give it to a rescue, they transfer ownership. And now the ownership is with the rescue. They have the right to do whatever they want because of the way laws and property and pets work. Um, the, the rescue would not have to give the animal back. I mean, the shelter wouldn't have to give the animal back either if, if a person came in, but they could and rescues could, but they, there's a certain, um, I, I think we've seen it out there is once they have it, they're like, no, you know, again, this is one of those, the owner didn't come back right. in time. So therefore they don't care. Right, exactly. Um, where, where so so yeah there's a combination of law and i guess policy and procedure that they have to come up with to actually address that. i think i think it's it's surmountable but it's not clear in what they're actually trying to do today that's a great question yeah exactly yeah and then one of the other ones is that i'm not sure that this putting all of the burden on the finder because what i'm kind of hearing is that they're saying, okay, let's not even take this lost pet into the shelter. Now, in some places, that's not even going to fly. Wisconsin is one of them. We have very a very clear law about what has to happen with the lost pet, and it, it, it it's supposed to go to an animal control facility. Um, but in other places where that's not maybe quite so clear, um, now you've put all the burden on the finder, and that includes not only the emotional burden but the financial burden as well. And um, you know, I've got questions like, so now, how is that? How is that pet going to get scanned? Is the finder then going to have to put gas in their car to take the the pet to a to find a vet that will scan it? You know, the shelters or the shelter going to do it? Um, you know, there's all these financial burdens that feeding the 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 found pet, um, housing the found pet. Uh, maybe he's going to need a collar and a leash while they keep it. Maybe it's not going to get along with their dog. And so there's going to be an altercation and there's going to be a vet bill. And who's going to, you know, there's just, and we're already seeing some of this um, already, some, some very interesting uh, situations that have come up. 
Um, and then again, the emotional burden on the finder. So it's very easy for the finder who, who probably loves animals to start to make um, assumptions about that owner. And now they've invested some emotion into the animal. They've invested some finances into the animal. They've invested time into the animal. And it's very easy for them to make the assumption that that owner does not, should not get their pet back. Yes. I, yeah, that's another good way of looking at it. I think that still needs to be flushed down. Again, I think that's surmountable as well. But they do have to figure out, well, what is the liability of that, that finder? Um, um, and, and what services do they have that could help that finder? Like, uh, we have a food bank, so you don't, you don't have to pay for food. Um, you do have to come by and drop it off, or, or, or maybe they have a way to drop off food or something like that. But they have to think about that kind of thing. And then, yeah, the, the scanning, um, a couple other things. So they do have to think those through, I think. Uh, yeah, I think they have to look at those details. I think that's, those are really good points. Did you have anything else that you saw? Um, and then, so there was one, let's see. Oh, and then, and basically, I, I'm seeing a lot of good uh, information out there about where to post. Next door is great. We love Next door. I think it's one of the, uh, and people don't know, it's kind of a neighborhood app, very localized. So I can join the Next door from my community, and I think two neighboring communities, but it doesn't go any further than that. Um, so it has its location. I'm in more of an urban setting, so I touch seven neighborhoods. So I'm going to have mine in that, then I touch seven, yeah. And so you can post in all of those, right? Yeah. Yes. So, and, but of course, what we know is that um, dogs have four legs and they walk, cats walk as well, and they can go beyond those neighborhoods really quickly. And then, so you're not reaching those people. So again, we're just harping on this all the time. It's got to be a centralized database where everybody can access it, not just in the neighborhood and the next door, you know, the neighborhood next to that, but in the next county and in the next state and in the next, you know, province, um, uh, so that we can help get more of these pets back home because they are often either walking and crossing jurisdiction lines or they are being picked up and transported across jurisdiction lines. Yeah, and animal law, unfortunately, is at best at the state level, but more likely at the county or the local level for that kind of thing. But that's something that I think needs to be pushed outside of the legal realm and in the the industry just working together. Well, we're out of time, Kathy. Um, we're going to talk again about some other things, and we'll uh, we'll be back. This was a great conversation. Thank you so much for today. And we will uh, see everyone later. Thank you.